This is part 2 chapter 2 of what if the Kamado siblings parted ways. Link in description. Shout out to God Godin for asking for this next part. If you enjoy this fanfic then Luke, comment, and subscribe for more. Let's start. Branching Paths by Skyward Strike. Chapter 2. Final Selection. Satoshi Yuteki was 17 years of age. He was brown of hair, like his mother, but had deep cyan eyes, like his father. The latter in particular had been a demon slayer in life, but just before Satoshi was born, had run into a powerful demon and had been injured beyond fighting condition. Forced shortly thereafter to leave the core. Nonetheless, he had grown up as a boy hearing tales of his father about his days as a demon slayer and his brave exploits. At first, he thought those were only stories, until the day when he was nine, and ended up wandering too far into the forest near their village. Getting lost as it got dark and left him unable to find his way back home. He remembered vividly running into the long-teethed monster with horns, how it had tried to attack him and how his father had jumped out of nowhere with a katana to decapitate the monster. Since that day his already weak father spent the rest of his life more often incapacitated in bed than not. But Satoshi knew from that day onward that he had to become a demon slayer himself when he grew up, to protect others just like his father had protected him. As it was explained to him later. It was because he'd pushed himself to use the special breathing technique from the demon slayers the day that his father took a turn for the worse and died when he was only 13. And though he grieved, it all only strengthened his resolve to become a demon slayer. His mother had tried to convince him otherwise, of course, but there was little she could do to stray his mind. Satoshi, as she'd always said, was a perceptive one. And yet, he was undoubtedly stubborn. As he told her, however, he wasn't going in as just a defenseless kid. He had been taught a breath style like the one used by the demon slayers by his father before his death, who in turn had been taught the same in his youth by an actual pillar. Yurokodaki, the former water pillar, who had managed to slay his fair share of demons before finally retiring. He'd heard plenty about him from his father. Satoshi had once sought said old man out some time after his father's death in hopes of learning more about the breath of water, but the masked geezer refused to teach him. Saying he should return home and live out a normal life in peace rather than seeking out something as dangerous as being a demon slayer. Yurokodaki didn't understand though. Neither he nor his mother did. It didn't matter, as Satoshi trained by himself almost ceaselessly for the next few years, mastering the three breath of water techniques his father had taught him as far as he could. Even after all this training, he didn't quite feel ready, but knew this was a step he'd have to take eventually. From his father's tales, he remembered it was a secular tradition of the demon slayers to hold the event known as the final selection in Mount Fujikasane every year on the last day of winter and the first day of spring. Starting at exactly midnight. This was the test that set apart those who joined the Demon Slayer Corps and those who died trying. Satoshi knew it was dangerous, but he felt confident in his skills after all his training. So he'd gone off in the middle of the night, leaving only a note behind for his mother, taking with him his father's belongings from when he himself was a Demon Slayer. First was his katana, the same wielded once by his father the night he'd saved his life. It was made of Nishirin, the metal demon slayers used to kill demons. Its hilt was wrapped in white cloth and it had a bronze hexagonal rain guard. Its blade, as natural for Nishirin swords to do, had switched color in accordance to his father's own affinity, that being a pearly white that outlined the length of his edge. That though was not something one would really notice as it hung sheathed to Satoshi's waist. Second was his Howry, as it was old tradition for great demon slayers to wear. His father's was blue on one side and green on the other, but mixed in together in the middle to form a shade of cyan that had left Satoshi awestruck when he first saw it so many years ago. He felt proud to now wear it himself. The last, well, it was a bit more specific. As he stared up the long flight of stairs leading to the place where the final selection would take place, blooming wisteria trees surrounding him for as far as the eye could see. Standing underneath a large Torii gate just like his father's stories had described, he couldn't help but feel nervous. He'd have to fight the same kind of demons as the one that had given him nightmares for years. 
For reassurance, he sought out from underneath his howry the last item he'd taken of his father's before coming here. It was an old warding mask, supposedly charged in with a spell to ward danger. It was given to his father by his master, Yurokodaki, right before his own final selection trials. It was made to be shaped like a fox, with a playful smile and long ears. The one thing he had first noticed about it when his father had shown him many years ago were the cyan eyes, squinted but undoubtedly painted to look like his father's, and his own for that matter. Whatever the spell in it was, it must have worked. He remembered word by word his father's response to him asking whether his final selection had been hard for him despite how long ago it was. Oh, it was easy as pie. The demons brought into the mountain were killed year after year, so they never got much of a chance to feed apparently. They'd be fodder for any half-baked demon slayer, let alone your old man. If dad can do it, Satoshi thought, staring from his father's mask to the top of the long flight of stairs ahead of him with renewed determination, then so can I. The way up was a long and tense one, Satoshi holding onto his sword's hilt with a tight grip as he walked up a step at a time. He knew from his father's story that he wouldn't be the only one up there. Many others wished to become demon slayers too, after all. His mind was racing as he tried to imagine the kind of people who'd be waiting for him up there. Finally though, he arrived, and much like he expected, Satoshi was not alone. With a quick headcount, there were at least 30 kids, most of them younger or about his own age, all standing in the clearing that made up the ceremonial grounds surrounded by wisteria. They all carried their own swords, and looked quite tough to boot. Most kept to themselves, some conversed with one another, and a few even glared at Satoshi as he tried to find a corner of his own in the clearing to wait out for the selection to begin. It was while he did so that he heard a conversation between two of the Demon Slayer prospects that caught his attention. Look at that kid. Just who the hell does he think he is? One of them. A boy wearing his dark blue hair in a samurai bun said. A dead man, that's who. The other one, with tanned skin and a busket, commented, who in their mind would even come here without a sword anyway. This caught Satoshi's attention, and he allowed himself to sneak in a glance at who the two boys were talking about. To his surprise, he'd find someone he had missed in his initial headcount of the people in there. The boy in question was peacefully sitting underneath a wisteria tree in a meditative position. He seemed just a bit younger than Satoshi, and had ruffled burgundy hair falling down to his shoulders with reddened tips and a mark on the left side of his forehead. Though it was hard to tell whether it was a scar or just a birthmark. He wore a white kimono top with a dark grey hakama and a black obi, donning a crimson haori on top of that alongside a pair of earrings that seemed to have been made to look like Hanafuda cards. True to the boy's conversation, he had no katana on him, nor any visible weapon. And yet something in him called Satoshi's attention more than any other person present. The fact that he had no reaction to those two badmouthing him despite them being clearly on earshot only served to exacerbate that curiosity. That same fact must have had a different reaction with the two boys, who seemed to take issue with his lack of acknowledgement in their words, and soon enough had surrounded his meditating form. Hey, kid, you must be lost. This here is a place for future demon slayers. The first of them warned him, someone who can't even get a sword to fight, and with has no business even trying. The meditating boy finally opened his dark red eyes and turned to look at the first boy in acknowledgement, remaining silent in light of his taunting. But still staring him down completely nonchalantly in response. This seemed to rub the second boy the wrong way, however, as he suddenly lunged, a hand gripping onto the swordless boy's collar as he pulled at him aggressively. So you're just gonna pretend you didn't hear him, huh? Who the hell do you think you are anyway, bastard? Said, bastard, narrowed his eyes slightly, before opening his mouth and speaking for the first time since Satoshi had taken note of him. My name is Tanjiro Kamado, the boy announced. And I will be the one to slay every last demon out there. His words were loud and clear, spoken with no second thought yet nonetheless seeming to echo across the clearing. Well over half the heads present turned to look at this Tanjiro Kamado, most of them glaring. The demon slayer's core were almost exclusively made of people who had lost those dear to them to a demon. 
To hear some punk talking big as if those same demons were nothing to him felt disrespectful to many of them on a personal level. What did you just say? The boy holding Tanjiro by his collar snarled before swinging a punch at his face with his other hand, you cocky piece of shit. The punch never landed as Tanjiro's palm shot up to intercept it, his nonchalant stare unbroken. I think we should all save our energy for the actual selection. He told them both. The other boy seemed ready to jump in as well, but just as the one who'd started the fight opened his mouth to reply, they would both be interrupted by a voice calling out, everyone. Please gather round, it said, before being followed by a similar, but not quite identical voice, the final selection is soon to begin. Satoshi glanced at the direction it came from to see two children positioned between two of the numerous poles set around the clearing, these ones at its northernmost end. The two were strikingly similar and were almost certainly siblings, distinguished only by their hair colors, one being white and the other black. Though whether they were boys or girls he couldn't quite tell, though they both looked effeminate. Satoshi had previously taken note of them but hadn't been able to give it much thought with the plethora of new faces and personalities surrounding him. Glancing back at the confrontation, Satoshi saw the boy with the busket now glare briefly at Tanjiro alongside his friend with the samurai bun before letting go of him, grunting out, whatever. Dead man. Before starting to walk up to the two children alongside the rest of the Demon Slayer prospects. Tanjiro though would allow himself a moment as he seemed to take a deep breath, before suddenly turning to the side and meeting Satoshi's gaze. The older boy quickly looked away awkwardly, but Tanjiro just turned to look forward again before walking up to the children alongside the others. To kill every single demon, that's a tall order. Satoshi mused as he allowed himself to glance back at the swordless boy who'd made such a bold claim, and yet, he wasn't boasting. That kid actually meant what he said. Is he really that full of bravado or? The boy shook his head. Despite his curiosity having been piped by the boy, he pushed that though back, opting to focus on the matter at hand. After all, it was about to start. Greetings, everyone. The black-haired child said once they were all gathered. Thank you for all gathering tonight for the final selection trials. Mount Fujikasane is home to demons that demon slayers have previously captured alive and trapped here. Demons hate wisteria flowers, which bloom here throughout the year regardless of the season, the white-haired child then informed them. They grow in the mountain from its foot up to halfway up the slope. Of course, this was all stuff Satoshi had been informed of by his father's stories, yet was still paying close attention to their words if only to give him something to focus on other than his own nervousness. The others around him also seemed to be taking in the information, some with giddy excitement, others nervously, like himself. A select few though seemed completely unbothered by the danger they were about to be put in. Tanjiro, as he noted once finding him in the crowd, definitively fell into the latter of the three. From this point on the wisteria flowers do not bloom. The black-haired child warned them then, Therefore, the demons residing here roam free to do as they please. You all must survive amidst them for seven days. Those who manage to do so and return to this place at the dawn of the seventh day will have passed the selection and shall be granted the title of Demon Slayer. The white-haired child explained. If you chose to come down beforehand, you will be forfeiting and, should you be injured, will be provided with medical attention. With that said, the final selection trials is officially starting. Both then said with uncanny synchronicity. Now go. At once, every single demon slayer prospect would dash, past the children and up the mountain. Quickly the group around Satoshi would thin out, each one taking their different ways up. In no time, he'd be running alone through the dark forest, wisteria no longer blooming around him. He swallowed dryly, nervousness hitting him again, but all it took was fishing for the fox mask in his howry to give him the needed strength. I won't fail now, father's right here with me, he told himself as he donned the mask over his face, he'll give me the needed strength. With his resolve hardened, Satoshi gripped tightly around his katana's hilt, continuing moving his way deeper into the darkness. Much further up in the mountain, a single horned demon was running his way up as well, and rather desperately too. He had been captured and put there only months ago, but he knew from the word of other demons that today was the day the takers of the final selection made their way up the mountain. 
and would stay there for a whole week hunting them down. As a weaker demon than most in there, he knew his best chance was to hide away for this time. He'd hunted enough wild animals to make sure he could stay the whole week without becoming too bloodlusted, as it so happened to weaker demons like him when they didn't eat for too long. Luckily, for that same reason, he also didn't need all that much nourishment to keep going. Maybe, if he found a good hiding spot, he could wait out and get the jump on a demon slayer as to feed on them. That line of thought was interrupted by an odd sound, similar to that of water evaporating, only somewhat louder. The confused demon stopped its dash after a moment, staring off to the side where the sound was before his eyes widened. Some thirty feet beside him was a crouched figure, its muscular back bare for him to see. It rose from his squat, holding to either side of him two blades, its edges serrated similar to the teeth of a beast. And then, it turned to look at him, revealing that despite having the body of a man, his head was that of a boar. And the steaming sound was that of the air leaving its nostrils similar to clouds of vapor. The horned demon froze for a moment, taking a single step back, then another, before turning back and rushing off full speed in the opposite direction to the boar-headed swordsman. What was that? It wielded swords, so it must be a demon slayer. Dot but what is up with its head? The horned demon thought as he continued running. Once he felt like he'd opened a safe distance, the demon would turn his head to try and see if the figure was following him, only to catch, from the corner of his eye, sight of a blur moving right past him as he did so. He'd turn back forward only to see the boar-headed swordsman with both feet planted against the side of a tree trunk in front of him. Before he could even react, the swordsman leapt at him with great speed, and with a swing of one of his serrated swords, hacked the demon's head apart from his body. Unable to do much, the head could only stare at his killer from the ground in shock as he rose back to his feet after his landing. No. This can't be happening. Dot it's too early. Dot how did this guy even get up the mountain so fast? The boar then stared up for a moment before taking a deep breath and releasing a scream of pure agony and frustration, not enough. This is not enough, he cried out to the heavens, those jerks told me I was gonna get to fight strong demons if I came here. What is up with this shitty shit? He pointed his blade at the fallen horned demon's head, who in turn could only watch it all in shock amidst this disintegration. After another moment, he seemed to calm down as he dramatically sighed in disappointment, lowering both his boar head and his blades depressively, oh, well. He looked up again. Guess I'll just have to find something stronger to beat up. The boar-headed swordsman then laughed hysterically as he ran off. Leaping energetically from tree trunk to tree trunk leaving the shocked demon behind to finish disintegrating. Amidst all his fear, then horror, then shock, then plainly being weirded out by the boar person, the only thought that crossed the demon's head before he disintegrated completely was. That was I really just killed by that guy. That's just. Embarrassing. Just like some demons were running away up the mountain to hide though, others were going down to face the demon slayers head on. Such was the case for one such demon, this one over seven feet tall with a body composed almost purely of muscle and an extra pair of arms protruding from underneath the first two. The four-armed demon was no newcomer. This was his third final selection. The first one he'd killed and eaten two demon slayers, and in the second one it was three. They were quite spread out around the mountain, and with many others praying for them it wasn't exactly easy to stack up the numbers. Not to mention the many that had managed to escape him. This year though, he was going to beat his record, have at least five humans. Needless to say, he was a pretty big deal in this enclosed space, even if he was far from reaching the level of the self-proclaimed, king of the mountain in all his fancy hands. But still, he would persevere, and eat more and more humans, and eventually dethrone the king and take the crown for his own. That was his motivation to become stronger and stronger and stronger, strong enough to eventually leave this prison of a mountain and make his own life outside again as a powerful demon. Feeling fired up, the demon looked up and screamed out a challenge to the heavens, demon slayers, come at me. I am right here, waiting for you all. He paused then, looking around to see if there was any response to his outburst, but all he got was a soft breeze blowing in the wind. The demon grunted, somewhat disappointed no one had appeared to rise up to his challenge, 
and kept on walking when he suddenly heard the sound of a tree branch rustling and turned to look back. Only to unexpectedly be met face to face with a girl diving head first to the ground from the trees above. There was a brief moment in time where their gazes locked as she stood there, upside down at a perfect eye level with him. A serene smile plastered on her face before her pink eyes narrowed and she swung her sword for his neck, surgically slicing his head off his body with a single motion of her arm. She'd spin around and land on one knee, while the still-shocked demon had both his body and head hit the ground roughly. He'd never seen nor heard her coming up until the last moment, and even then it was well too late to react, what? He uttered out in disbelief, unable to fully comprehend what had just happened. The girl in question though rose back to her feet, her black hair held by a butterfly ornament in a ponytail blowing about slightly in the wind as she resheathed her blade. Serene smile still present while she watched the demon. She seemed to pause for a moment before she fished out something out of her pink kimono and drew out a coin. Without a word, she flipped it a few feet into the air before unceremoniously catching it back in her hand. She narrowed her eyes, and without even checking the coin, looked back over to the demon, too loud. Was all she said to him. Before turning her back on him and beginning to walk off in a delicate yet firm stride. The demon's shock quickly faded then turning into anger, get back here, girl. He shouted out at her as his head began disintegrating, I refuse to be slain by you and your dirty tricks. Fight me like a warrior so I can tear you apart and devour you. Don't you ignore me now, girl. I will be getting stronger and stronger and I will crush you like. He was cut off as his mouth disintegrated leaving him unable to keep talking. But continued cursing and ranting all the way in his mind, even as the girl disappeared into the darkness and left him to fade away. Elsewhere in the mountain, a demon too stood atop a tree, hidden in the shadows of the branches, waiting for his prey. This one, much like the others, had a distinguishing trait in the form of a third eye sprouting from his forehead. Said I, along with his other two, were all watching a none the wiser demon slayer prospect walking through the forest, completely unaware of what was about to happen. The thought brought a grin to the demon's face. It had been too long since he'd been allowed to play with a human. Those weaker demons were fine, animals even, in a pinch, but it didn't quite feel the same as inflicting pain into an actual human. They were the only ones who were fully aware they were about to die, and that's why they were the ones who broke down the hardest. That's why they were the ones who made him feel the most. Almost. The three-eyed demon told himself, waiting eagerly for the right moment, almost, almost. The demon slayer below stopped. Despite the darkness around them not allowing him to make the human's features out all that well, he could see now that it was a boy, now. The demon leapt from his tree branch. The grin in his face widening to a near maniacal degree. The boy wouldn't notice until it was just a moment too late. He tried to draw his katana but couldn't swing it as the demon grabbed onto his forearm and landed on top of him, holding down his dominant hand by its wrist and, consequentially, his sword with it. The boy tried to aim a punch at him with his free hand as a last-ditch effort, but the demon easily grabbed his fist, now, now. Come on there, he said before tightening his grip and breaking numerous bones in the boy's left hand, including every single finger, and causing him to grunt out in pain. Let's not be aggressive here. The three-eyed demon then moved his other hand over to the boy's wrist, giving it a squeeze as well. This forced the still grunting boy to release the sword. The demon would immediately take advantage of that, taking the sword himself with his free hand and slowly raising it, the tip aiming at the boy's shoulder. The demon slayer prospect tried to struggle, but it was of little use, and he was unable to prevent the demon from impaling him through the right shoulder with his own sword. Using it to pin him down to the ground, this time making the boy scream out. You bastard. He grunted out in spite of the pain he was in. I'm gonna kill you. I swear I'm gonna kill you. The demon would chuckle. Now that he was closer, he could actually tell what the boy looked like. He had a busket with a clump of black hair emerging from the middle of his head and a massive scar on running from his right temple, across his cheekbone and over to his nose. Not to mention looking extremely pissed off. Why aren't you quite the punk? But I'm not here to hear you talk, kiddo. The demon informed him, covering the boy's mouth with his hand to stop his cursing. Let me tell you something, brat. 
Ever since I became a demon I can't feel the anything anymore. No happiness, no sadness, no anger, no nothing. It's only hunger most of the time, except when I hurt someone. He then grabbed the boy's sword by the hilt and twisted it into his shoulder, leading to him screaming again. Though this time he was muffled by the hand covering his mouth, that's the only time I ever feel actual joy nowadays. He was about to break the boy's other arm when he suddenly paused, realizing the hand he was holding over his mouth was being bitten into. Why, still got some fight into you, huh? The demon raised his hand before bashing the boy's head against the ground, again and again, yet he refused to let go. Until he ended up managing to bite out a chunk of the hand's perlicu, which he promptly swallowed. A human with a taste of demon meat. That's a first. The three-eyed demon mused, clenching his quickly healing hand into a fist which he raised, about to pummel the boy into a gory mess. I don't mind though, let's call it your last meal. Before he could bring his fist down though, he felt something pressing against his chest and, with the pull of a trigger, the three-eyed demon was blasted off the boy and back a couple feet. He sat back up quickly with a grunt, a large hole in his chest where he could now see the boy had shot him with a gun of sorts, smoke still coming out off his barrel as he himself rose to his feet. He had a gun on him. Dot but how did he even pull the trigger? I crushed his whole hand, he thought, before noticing that the hand he had indeed crushed moments ago, the hand that was also now holding that gun, had entirely healed from the damage he'd caused it. What? What the hell is up with this kid? Well, I think it's time I tell you something. The boy grunted then. Wrapping his free hand around his katana's hilt before pulling the sword stuck in its shoulder right out of its wound in one painful motion before raising it at the demon. The vicious look in his eyes making it clear that his anger far overwhelmed his pain right now, I don't give a shit what you feel or don't feel. I'm gonna kill you either way. And you know why. The boy then rushed him with his blade, and despite the large gun wound in his chest already healing, the demon couldn't back up fast enough. Only able to raise his arm to have it lopped right off as it intercepted the katana, cause I'm a fucking demon slayer. He announced before swinging his blade again. This time having it make contact with the intended target as it cut into the demon's neck and decapitated him. The self-proclaimed demon slayer panted then, lowering his sword before returning it to its scabbard. After a brief look around, he'd walk up to and pick up the demon's arm, storing it away in his kimono. Said demon though was still surprised at what had just happened, and could only watch as the boy reloaded his gun, the wound on his shoulder having already stopped bleeding, I lost. What about that, huh? He thought aloud, regaining the boy's attention, no wonder though. I thought I was picking a fight with a human. Dot but you're a lot more like a demon than you let on, no. The boy narrowed his eyes before grunting, pointing his gun again at the decapitated demon's head. Fuck off, he said before firing, blasting what remained of the demon's head into pieces. In his last moments of consciousness as his scattered remains turned to dust, the remaining third eye would watch as the boy hot-headedly marched off into the darkness of the forest. On the other side of the mountain, a girl in white robes found herself kneeled in the middle of the forest, her hands buried into her face as she cried. It wasn't long until one of the selection takers that was passing nearby heard her crying, and would follow the noise back to her then, Miss. What are you doing here? Don't you know this place is dangerous? It's full of demons here, the boy said, approaching the crying woman from behind. Getting close to her, he'd place a hand in her shoulder, Miss, I. He wouldn't get another word in however as the girl whipped around and swung at him, hitting him and sending the boy flying back first into a tree before falling down to the ground. He grunted, struggling to get back up. The girl in question, upon turning around, had fully revealed her monstrous features, namely her large black eyes with cat-like pulls and numerous pulsing veins all over her face and neck. You humans are all so gillable. The demon said mockingly as she approached the boy, raising her large nails ready to tear him apart. That trick always worked out there and it still works here. You demon slayer wannabes are really no different. The boy, now realizing the situation he was in, froze for a moment before crying out. Quickly backing up in a panic but hitting a tree he'd just crashed into head first and seeming to momentarily pass out only to blink back awake, look up at the demon. 
and cry out again in fear as he began sobbing uncontrollably. The demon paused, realizing then how much of a weakling the target she'd picked was and beginning to laugh mockingly. Oh, you're even more pathetic than I thought. That's great, she cackled, I've been waiting so long to get a chance to taste another human. Animals are just not enough anymore, and other demons taste like shit. Humans don't wander easily into this mountain, so you wouldn't believe how hungry a demon can get. Peek peek please don't eat me, the boy stuttered, sniffling as snot ran down his nose from his excessive crying, I, I don't taste good, I swear. I haven't taken a bath in five days. No kidding, five whole days. Oh, kid, I won't just eat you. The demon then grinned widely, revealing her two rows of excessively sharp teeth, through which a bifurked tongue snaked out. I think I'll start by ripping your head off slowly. Only fitting given what your kind is to us. Then I'll feast on your organs, your skin, muscles. I'll drink every sip of blood from you I can get. And when I'm done I'll pick my teeth with what remains of your bones. This seemed to be too much for the poor boy, who then let out a silent scream before passing out in fear. For real this time, the demon's grin turned into a more sadistic smile then, watching the pathetic form of the boy lunched against the tree. He wasn't very big, so it wouldn't be the feast she wanted, but something about his yellow kimono and matching hair made it really appetizing to her. As her eyes laid on his katana however, she groaned in disdain. And yet he never even tried to reach for it. She chuckled slightly, lucky me. Of all the humans coming up the mountain, I found the weakest one first. She took a step forward towards him, and she blinked. Which was a mistake, because when she opened her eyes, the boy was no longer lying against the tree. The demon only had a moment to contemplate what was happening before she fell herself falling without a body to call her own, her head having been separated from it in the literal blink of an eye. The demon's head hit the ground, and she could only watch as the risen boy now stood with his back facing her some ten feet from where her head had fallen. Hand resting on the hilt of his sheathed katana, what, what did you do? She asked, but received no response as the boy groggily began walking again, not even turning his head to acknowledge her. What did you do? She called out more loudly, now beginning to actually cry as she watched what she thought would certainly be her prey just walk off. She had little time to speak though, before the disintegration covered her mouth and she was left only able to watch and wait for her inevitable end, you, that you were supposed to be the weakest. Not all Demon Slayer prospects were being as successful as in those situations though. One such example was a certain boy with a samurai bun and dark blue hair. He found himself cornered, with a demon menacingly approaching him from one side and the edge of a cliff in the other, a deep gash marring the side of his head from his forehead. Over his eye into his cheek. He was panting heavily, holding his sword before him with trembling hands, I did it, it was tough, but I cut its head off. He thought to himself, so, not why is it still coming at me? This thing should be dead. The demon cackled at him, you might have some talent, but you didn't come here prepared. If you weren't such a dumbass, you might have even killed me. It rushed the boy, who tried to swing at the incoming threat, but with his damaged eye, depth perception was not exactly his forte. And thus his swing was way overshot and missed its target entirely, allowing the demon to knock the blade right off his hands and punch him in the gut, sending him sprawling. Landing only a few feet away from the cliff. He struggled to rise quickly, but knew he had no means to defend himself with as the demon once again lunged at him. Tough shit, kid, you're done for. The boy closed his eyes, preparing for his end, except it never came. Instead, he heard the sound of flesh being cut and something dull hitting the ground, then silence. Realizing he wasn't dead, the boy would open his eyes and see something unexpected. An all too familiar boy with long dark red hair and AA Crimson Howery stood before him. Both the demon's head and its body were before the newcomer, having been separated through obvious decapitation, as evidenced by the small bloodied wood axe the boy was currently holding. My name is Tanjiro Kamado, and I will be the one to slay every last demon out there. So he did have a weapon hidden away. The boy thought to himself, gazing at the axe, but... If my sword wasn't able to kill it, can he really do it with that tiny axe? Sure enough, just as Tanjiro was walking towards the head, 
Its eyes then opened, and it began shouting, You bastard. This was between me and him, who the hell do you think you are stepping in like that? The decapitated head ranted as its body quickly began rising back to his feet behind Tanjiro. I'll show you what happens to nosy humans like you. Look out, the boy warned as the body leapt into attack. Tanjiro didn't seem to need warning though as he easily moved to the side to dodge the body without as much looking, and when it stopped and tried to turn around, landed a kick flat on its chest. Pushing it back and causing it to fall off the cliff and into the forest of wisteria flowers awaiting down below. You son of a bitch. Now you really done it. The head ranted, with Tanjiro turning his attention back to it, you think that's gonna stop me? You can't kill me with those flimsy weapons. It told them even as it was grabbed and lifted by its hair, I'm just gonna heal from this and then I'll kill you both. Just you why, before it could even finish, Tanjiro had thrown the bodiless head off the cliff after the body, soon enough disappearing below under the wisteria as well. With things settled, the boy turned to look at his savior, unsure of what to say after having been saved by the same guy he'd tried to bully off the exam only hours ago. I, ah, uh, thank you, duh for that. Tanjiro though didn't seem to pay him no mind. Instead, he walked up to the sword that had been knocked off the boy's hands and knelt to pick it up, watching it closely for a moment before sighing, you know, it is a bit ironic. That you scolded me for not being armed when you're this unprepared for fighting demons. The boy blinked with his remaining eye, what do you mean? Demons can't be killed with normal weapons. There is only one metal able to slay them permanently, and this. He flipped the sword upside down and stabbed it into the ground, is not it. Oh, the boy said, feeling twice as embarrassed now. Not only was he saved by the person he'd almost started a fight with, but he was also obviously in the wrong for what he did antagonize with him about in the first place. Anyway, that gash on you looks bad. You should head back down the mountain and look for some medical attention. Tanjiro told him. Turning his back on the boy and starting to walk away, you won't be surviving the full seven days here with a blade like that. But... What about you? He then asked, you don't have a weapon with that special metal either, right? Tanjiro paused for a moment, before saying, I'll figure it out. Well, at least take my sword with you. The boy insisted, even if it can't kill them, it should be easier fighting with it than with that flimsy axe, right? The crimson-clad boy then only glanced from over his shoulder to the one he'd just saved, against the things in this mountain, I don't need more than this to defend myself. He said, before looking back forward and continuing walking. The boy narrowed his eye, still disliking the arrogant attitude that had first led him to picking that fight, but it was hard to argue with him now when he had just proven his point. All he could do then was to silently watch as Tanjiro purposefully made his way back into the forest, soon disappearing and leaving him once again alone. End of part 2 Hope you enjoyed this danfic what if and if you did then likely, comment, and subscribe for more. I'll see you all in the next part of this story. Peace out.